You are listening to The Overthinker's Guide to Joy, Episode 9. This week, I'm going to talk about another one of my favorite daily habits to manage my overthinking brain. This is the one about gratitude. Let's get started. Hey there, you are listening to The Overthinker's Guide to Joy. This is a podcast for overthinkers, overachievers, perfectionists, type A, stressed out, anxious people who just want to calm down and feel better. I'm your host, Certified Life Coach Jackie DeCronis. Hey there, and welcome back. As you all know, this podcast is all about managing your overthinking brain. And my whole philosophy is about managing your brain through good daily habits. I believe that good habits are the foundational work to creating a more successful, happier, healthier life. The truth is that bad habits are just easier. They're like low-hanging fruit. It's easier to watch TV than exercise. It's easier to eat French fries than cut up some vegetables. It's easier to drink soda than water. It's easier to leave dirty dishes in the sink rather than wash them. I know, I get it. But I'm not talking just about good physical habits. I'm talking about daily habits for mental hygiene too. How you manage your mind is as important as how you manage your physical space and body. You've heard me say this before. The brain is a tricky beast. It is our default setting to take the path of least resistance. Whatever is familiar is where our mind goes. Even if that familiarity is discomfort. It's why we often think about the worst case scenarios. And one of the worst habits we can develop is letting our negative thoughts run the show. So when one thing isn't going well, our brains want to trick us into believing that nothing is going well. It colors everything we see. This is where the old expressions come in. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. One bad apple spoils the whole barrel. Or as they say in the military, one oh shit wipes out 10 attaboys. It's the primitive part of our brain, also known as the amygdala, that keeps us safe from danger. But it can sometimes act like a bodyguard gone rogue, assuming that everything is trying to hurt us or destroy us. This reptilian part of our brain sometimes doesn't accurately discern the difference between almost driving off a cliff and the feeling of just being ghosted by a new friend or lover. They both feel catastrophic. So our go-to response is fight or flight. This is why we assume everything is going wrong because one little thing has gone wrong, or maybe one big thing has gone wrong. But this is where our overthinker's brain can easily spin out of control. Now, I have studied this for years, and I coach on it daily, and I still have to constantly monitor my own reptilian brain. So how do we manage our brains from going from that default setting of nothing is going well because I made a mistake at work, or I had a fight with my partner or my best friend, or I lost a client today, or I was working on a huge project and it didn't move forward, or I have to redo it all again. Whatever the circumstance is, it's one bad thing that then we've allowed to take over our whole sense of well-being. Well, of course the first thing you want to do is identify what is really wrong. I mean, that's the most important. Rather than having one bad thing go wrong and then my life is terrible or everything happens to me, or I'm such a victim, or et cetera, et cetera. You want to sit down and really think, what went wrong? What is really bothering me today, or yesterday, or this week? And then to the degree that you can fix it, if a mistake was made, own it, fix it. If an apology is owed, own it, fix it. And if you broke something, fix it, if you can But before you fall down the rabbit hole of everything is wrong, nothing is working, I want to recommend this, developing a daily gratitude practice. 
Now, I remember first hearing about gratitude as a way to manage your mental and emotional well-being and thinking, that just sounded so saccharine to me. Like, it's so overly simplistic. It's almost ridiculous. By the way, that's the exact same thoughts I had about meditation (laughs) before I started meditating every day. So if you listen to my earlier episode, you know that is now one of my four daily habits as well. But gratitude is the antidote to negative thinking. And it's especially important for my overthinkers. So how do we create a gratitude practice? Well, like most daily practices, there is no right or wrong way. And there certainly isn't one way. So here's a number of ways to create a gratitude practice. You can keep a gratitude journal. And in one of my earlier episodes, I talked about the power of journaling. Now, when we journal, I often recommend journaling to get out the negative thoughts. Like if something's on your mind, rather than venting to you know everybody you see or burdening your best friend, your partner, your mother, your sister, your brother with all the crap that happened during your day, I always say, get a journal, write that stuff down. Get it out of your head, acknowledge the feelings, and just get it out of your body. But I have had people say to me, ooh, I don't want to dwell on the negative, or I don't want to look back at a journal full of my complaints and my venting and my ranting because it makes me seem like such a negative person. That's not the intention of a journal. The intention of the journal is just for a safe place for you to get those thoughts out so they stop swirling in your head. But if you're concerned that you're just filling up books and notebooks and what have you of negative thoughts, one of the ways to combat that is writing down all those thoughts in their most authentic form and then taking a minute or a page or a paragraph, however you like to write, and putting a page of gratitude or a handful of things that you're grateful for so that while you're still being authentic about what is bothering you and what's on your mind and what needs to get out of your head, you can still take time to write down and create and cultivate a list of things you're grateful for. So that's one way. Another way to develop a gratitude practice is, of course, meditate. Now, if you're already meditating, and I hope you are, you can incorporate gratitude into your daily practice. You can start your meditation practice with saying something you're grateful for out loud or in your mind. When I used to teach yoga, I would always start every class with getting grounded, having everyone close their eyes and think about something they were grateful for. It changes the energy of the practice. It can change the energy of your meditation. It can change the energy of your whole day. You literally only need to think of one thing. Now, if you're grateful for two things or three things, that's even better. There's no limit. But starting or ending your meditation practice or even devoting your entire practice, whether you have a five-minute practice or a 20-minute practice, to something you are grateful for. That's a wonderful way to practice daily gratitude. Another way to practice gratitude is mentally thanking someone for something they did. Now, it's even better to verbally thank somebody, but if you don't have the opportunity if you've lost track of them or they live far away or you don't have any way to contact them, you can still mentally thank someone, mentally be grateful to someone for something that they did for you. There's power in that. Writing a thank you note is another way. Whether it's an email, a text, or a handwritten note, everything counts. There was a study done in 2017 where they took 300 college students seeking mental health counseling for depression and anxiety. And part of the study was to have participants, the students, write gratitude letters to someone who had done something for them or given them something. 23% of those letters were never sent. And what the results of the study show was that just the act of writing a letter of gratitude to someone whether or not it was sent, was just as powerful and created a positive change in their mood than those who sent it as well. So that's another way. If you have a religious practice, prayer is another way to practice gratitude, but gratitude is completely agnostic. 
So with or without religion, you can still have a daily practice. My clients often ask me, what is my gratitude practice? And the truth is, I do a little bit of all of that. But my favorite one is to wake up with gratitude. It's also known as count your blessings. Whether you wake up with gratitude or you go to sleep with gratitude or whether you do it at both times of the day, it's a very powerful practice. So in the mornings before I get out of bed, whether it's before my alarm went off or after my alarm goes off, I do not get out of bed until I can think of 10 things that I am grateful for. Now it changes and it's important to change them. So, you know, it's really easy to rattle off. I'm grateful for my husband. I'm grateful for my children. I'm grateful for my dog. But you don't want it to become so rote that you no longer feel it in your body. That's why you need to change it up. Now, listen, if you can cultivate the gratitude, that feeling in your body when you say those things or think those things, that's fine. You can do the same 10 over and over and over and over again. But I like to mix them up so that I really feel it in my body. So the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I pay attention to the temperature of the room. I love the morning because I find the air sort of the most delicious time of day. It's generally cool and it's very quiet outside. And usually for most people, right before your alarm goes off or right after you've turned your alarm off, it's the coziest time to be in bed, right? So that air is cool and the blanket is just the perfect temperature and it just feels good. And so I will express gratitude for that because that feeling of being calm or being cozy or being relaxed or having had a good night's sleep or even some sleep for me is something to be grateful for. But I really look for the small things. So it might be the softness of my sheets. It might be the warmth of my blanket. It might be the sunlight that's peeking through my blinds, or if it's raining, I'm grateful for that because I always love when it rains in the morning. It might be a bird chirping, or it might be for the fact that I wasn't awoken by my dog barking, (laughs) and so I'm grateful for that. It might be that I'm grateful for the fact that I have indoor plumbing and I can go brush my teeth with running water or flush a toilet or take a shower. The luxury of brushing my teeth. Sometimes I'll lay in bed and I'll think, I'm grateful that I'm safe, or I'm grateful that I have someone or something that needs me, whether it is my dog who needs to be fed, or it's my husband, or it is my clients who are waiting for me. Just having purpose in your day can be very powerful. So currently, I have a shoulder problem. And although there's no clear diagnosis, it appears to be frozen shoulder, which is sort of this condition that sometimes happens due to a major injury or a small injury. In my case, it was kind of a minor tweak. But for anyone who's ever had this condition, it starts out like a small injury or a tweak. And unlike most conditions, it's very unpredictable and it tends to get a lot worse before it gets a lot better. Now, as a tennis player, this is a nightmare because there's no good cures for it. There's a super risky surgery that works for some people. Some people respond really well to physical therapy, acupuncture, massage, cortisone injections. Unfortunately for me, nothing has worked yet. And it can last anywhere from six months to two years. And the good news is that research indicates it heals on its own, whether or not you have therapy, surgery, cortisone, what have you but it is excruciatingly painful in the wrong position. So sometimes it's like turning the wrong way. Sometimes it's reaching for like a cup on a shelf. It can be opening a door incorrectly and it can create this like massive shooting pain through your shoulder and it lasts for about 10 minutes until it stops throbbing. The worst of it is it makes it very difficult to sleep. So I had this condition before on my other shoulder about 10 years ago. And when you're a very active person like me, and you have, in my case, my whole social life kind of revolves around tennis. I play on tennis teams and I belong to a tennis club and most of my friends play tennis. And so that's like a big part of my afternoons or weekends. And that comes to a grinding halt when you have a shoulder issue. So it's a huge bummer. 
And on top of it, whether you're in physical pain or psychic pain, that can make it very difficult to quote, stay positive. This is where gratitude comes in. So I could go down a rabbit hole and be poor me. I can't play tennis. I can't see my friends. I'm in pain. I can't get a good night's sleep. None of the therapies are working. This could be a two-year problem. I've had this before. Why did it happen again? That's where my brain would like to go. (laughs) And in my darker moments, that's where it does go. But this is where gratitude comes in. I practice gratitude every day about this condition by saying this. I am so grateful that it's in my left shoulder instead of my right, because I'm right-handed. When I had this in my right shoulder, it made writing, cooking, cleaning, literally everything so difficult because I was so right-hand dominant. And so I was constantly recreating the nerve pain and I would be constantly having to stop doing whatever I was doing. Like even going to the grocery store was just an excruciating task. So the fact that it's in my left is less cumbersome, less debilitating. It's still annoying and I still do a lot of things with my left hand, but it's way, way, way better than the right. So I'm grateful. I'm grateful that I can still ride my Peloton bike every day and get the exercise I need to stay in shape and release the stress from my day because exercise is really, really important to me. And when you lose the mobility in one limb or one joint or another, it can often stop you in your tracks. So I'm grateful I still have an exercise that I like and that I can do. I'm grateful to have access to medical doctors and alternative healers who are doing their best to help accelerate my healing. Even if it doesn't work and it just has to heal on its own, I'm really grateful to be able to have a place to go and talk about this with people and try different things. I'm grateful to all my tennis friends who have called and suggested getting together for a walk or a lunch or a dinner or a happy hour in the jacuzzi. All things I can do, all things I love to do. And it makes me feel good and it makes me feel connected, even though I can't be part of their teams and part of their competitions. It's really awesome. I'm grateful to my husband who, albeit reluctantly, will massage my shoulders at night when we're watching our favorite shows on television. And he's really good about it. It's just he's reluctant because I always seem to have a sports injury. (laughs) And in his mind, if it were up to me, I would be asking him 24-7 to massage some body part but he is particularly sympathetic because this condition is real and it's here to stay for a little bit. I'm grateful for my meditation practice that includes guided meditations on healing that I listen to every day to utilize my own brain to expedite my healing process. I'm even grateful for the pain. And I know that sounds crazy, but I'm grateful for the pain because it reminds me how lucky I am to not live in chronic pain. And I know A lot of people do. And it also helps me remain compassionate for my friends and my family and my clients who are often suffering from one medical condition or another because that's the human condition. People get hurt. Accidents happen. People have illnesses. People have syndromes. And it's not always your fault. (laughs) It can just happen. And so by having pain, it is a great reminder that I'm human and that I need to remember that everybody suffers differently in different ways. And this keeps me humble and it keeps me compassionate for others. Now, gratitude practices take time, but they have a cumulative and long lasting effect. Scientists have discovered that gratitude has a direct effect on the brain by releasing the two neurotransmitters for happiness, which of course are dopamine and serotonin. So what are the benefits to gratitude? There are no side effects. It doesn't cost anything. It doesn't require training. It's available to you 24-7. It's portable. You can customize it to your own liking. It takes less than one minute to practice it. It can reduce symptoms of anxiety and depression. It can make you feel better. It can be effective in healing. It can promote better sleep and it can make you feel happier. So you have nothing to lose except anger, frustration, fear, and doubt. I encourage you to give it a try 
And I encourage you to make it a practice. You know what I'm most grateful for today? All of you who listened to this episode. And I'm especially grateful if you try practicing gratitude yourself. So I hope to see you all next week. I wish you a good one. Practice all your good daily habits and don't let your reptilian brain take over all the good things that are happening in your life. You have a good life and you can make it even better. If you want to learn more tips about managing your stress and how to manage your overthinking brain, just go to my website and sign up for my weekly newsletter at JackieDeCrenis.com. That's J-A-C-K-I-E-D-E-C-R-I-N-I-S.com. You can also follow me on Instagram at Jackie DeCrenis. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to this episode of Overthinker's Guide to Joy. If you like what was offered in today's episode, I would love you to leave a review and subscribe or follow wherever you get your podcasts.